Good morning, Crossroads. So glad that you're here this morning to worship with us, whether you're watching online or you're in Hampstead or here in Westminster. Thanks for joining us. If you couldn't tell, we're going to be talking about love today. And as you walked in or, or heard a song or saw a drawing, maybe you picked up on that. And, and so we're going to talk about love. And I would tell you that love's everywhere, but often it means Nothing. I mean, it has no widely technical definition. So you can use love in any old way you want. And so people use it in all sorts of different ways. It has no objectively quantifiable identifier. But yet, every culture since the beginning of time has esteemed this quality of love. And virtually every religion holds it up as a, as a high quality, uh, this idea of love. Everyone votes for love, right? Let's just say, who doesn't think love is better than hate or even better than indifference? We all vote for love every time. Love's everywhere. But so often, it's everywhere, and so it means nothing. It's like, it's like white noise. You know what white noise is? You know, it's that hum in the background that sort of just drives everything else, drowns everything else out doesn't have any real identity of its own. I think that's true about love. It's everywhere, and so it means nothing. I started looking up this week songs with love in the title, just to prove this point. Love is everywhere. You can hardly find a song that's not either about love or has love in the title. Let me prove it to you. I, I, I wrote down a few here. The songs, they were called Love Hurts, Love Stinks, Love Takes Time. You're going to start thinking of the people who sing them. Maybe get it stuck in your head. Love is a battlefield. Love is like oxygen. Love is a many splendored thing. Love will find a way. Love will keep us together, Captain and Tennille. Love lifts us up where we belong. You can't hurry love. You can't buy love. You, love takes time. There's crazy love, endless love, baby love, summer love, eat, pray love. That was a movie. Higher love, groovy kind of love. The beaters, Beatles, the beaters? No. The Beatles sang, All You Need Is Love. Huey Lewis sang about the power of love. Robert Palmer is addicted to love. Bon Jovi claims that you gave love a bad name. The Eagles sing about the best of my love. Roxette, it must have been love. Anybody remember that one? Yeah. Whitney Houston, Saving All My Love. Rihanna, We Found Love. Eminem said, I love the way you lie. That's a little weird. Not as weird, though, as Meatloaf, who sang, I'd do anything for love, but I won't do that. James Bond from Russia with love. Then there's questions that these songs raise. How deep is your love? What's love got to do with it? Can you feel the love? What more in the name of love? There's requests from Elvis, love me tender. Ed Sheeran, give me love. There's I love Lucy, I love rock and roll, I love a rainy night, I love a parade. I love it when a plan comes together. And of course, I love you. You love me. Yeah. Love's everywhere. But it means nothing. Now, that's not such a big deal until you combine it with the biblical premise that God is love. Until you read a scripture like John 3.16. For God so loved. When we begin to identify God as love and his activity as loving, what happens is that we begin to see God as just uh, white noise. We begin to see God as just this in the background, meaningless hum of life. Th that maybe you would vote for instead of against, but ends up meaning not God is everywhere but maybe means nothing. And I'll tell you one thing. There's a lot of things that you could argue that God is. Nothing is not one of them. And so, here's what we want to do. Over the next several weeks leading up to Easter, we want to talk about love. We want to investigate it, define it, pull it apart, put it back together, and apply it to our lives. We want to get serious about love. And so uh, over the next five weeks, in fact, we're going to look at the same scripture every week. And it, 
we're going to go and, and we're going to look at an author who perhaps has written the most famous thing ever said about love. No, it's not Nicholas Sparks. Who said that? No. It's not Shakespeare or Thoreau. It's the Apostle Paul. And it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So if you have a Bible, that's where we're going to start this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to read all 13 verses uh, of this chapter. Listen. And now I will show you the most excellent way. By speaking the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there's knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I reasoned like a child. I talked like a child. I thought like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these, is love. This is God's word. And my guess is you've heard that before. This is a very famous chapter. Maybe it's the most famous chapter in the whole Bible. Uh, maybe Psalm 23 would, would be right up there. Maybe the Sermon on the Mount. But certainly, for the vast majority of people in our country, you've heard that somewhere. If you've been to a wedding or two, my guess is you may have heard parts of this before. Some of these words probably were familiar as I began to read them. They're so familiar to some of us, used so frequently, that we get the, uh, the tone already locked in. As soon as I start reading, if I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, love is patient, love is kind, butterflies and rainbows. Right? That's just sort of, the way that we think about this scripture. So here's what I want to do today. I, I want to give you the backdrop behind this, the verses that we just read. Because they, taken out of context, will always sort of tend to take on that um, ushy, gushy, uh, lovey-dovey feel. And I think what you're going to find by the time we're finished today is nothing could be farther from their intent. So, so I want to give you the backdrop, and then ultimately, there's a bombshell here. I, I think it's an enormously impactful passage. So after I give you the, the background, I'll give you the bombshell, and then maybe at the end we'll do a little reconnaissance and see if we can put the pieces back together for us. Okay, so let me give you some background here. First of all, this is chapter 13. So obviously there are 12 chapters that come before but let's even take a step back beyond that. And it's a book called 1 Corinthians, which is really a letter or maybe two letters put together sent to a church in Corinth. Let's see, we got to know something about Corinth. The Apostle Paul is writing a letter to a group of believers who are living in Corinth in the first century. Now, it turns out Corinth is actually in southern Greece. I did not know that. I had to look it up. And it's positioned in such a way that it was a major trade route, both north and south as people went through Greece, but also 
east and west. It, it sits on this little about four mile wide spit of land so that it, it was almost like the Panama Canal with no canal. That you could take your uh, cargo and get it off of a boat and take it four miles and put it on another boat and save a long way around the southern tip of Greece. So, so Corinth was, is still situated in a, in a really important uh, place in terms of trade routes. And, and so it, it was a, a flourishing uh, mercantile uh, place of business until, it turns out, 146 B.C. Because at that point, it was completely destroyed. 146 B.C., the whole um, city of Corinth was flattened, completely and utterly destroyed by Rome. And it lay fallow, undeveloped, uninhabited for over 100 years. No one lived in Corinth. From 146 to 44 B.C., Julius Caesar, named the salad dressing after him, remember you heard them? Yeah, he uh, revitalizes, he refounds the city of of Corinth in 44 B.C. Now, why is that important? Here's why. Because no one then, uh, about a generation or so later, was from Corinth. Uh, lots of people moved there, but no one was from there. It had this uh, very, very diverse population. People came from all over the place. Uh, lots of different cultures, lots of different socioeconomic groups, and everybody moved to Corinth in order to make money, in order to look for power and money. So it was a completely pagan culture. Uh, One uh, historian I read uh, talked about the temple that was up on the hill outside of Corinth that housed, some would say, a thousand temple prostitutes who would just come down into the city uh, every evening and, and there would be worship, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and so anything goes in Corinth. In fact, uh, in the first century B.C., to Corinthianize someone had a meaning. To Corinthianize someone would mean that they would adopt this sort of laissez-faire attitude. If it feels good, do it. If you can afford it, go for it. That was what the Corinthians were about. And this is where the church the Apostle Paul is writing to, was founded. That's where these people were living out their faith in Jesus Christ. These same people came to Christ and their lives were being transformed and Paul is writing them this letter. Just step back for a second and think about that. Corinth would have been one of the least likely places on the planet at that time for a group of Christ followers to be birthed. And yet there they were. And the church began to to flourish. And and all of those people began to hear about this Jesus who died and rose again. It was not like they didn't have their challenges. And so chapters 1 through 12 is the Apostle Paul talking about some of the challenges that they had. They, They had challenges that there were quarrels and divisions among them. They had struggles with sexual immorality. They had struggles with gluttony when they got together for the Lord's table like we're going to do this morning. Um, People just gorged themselves and got drunk. And the Apostle Paul was saying, I think you've missed the point here. Let me explain to you what we're doing when we come together and remember the death and resurrection of Christ. So, in other words, they were certainly thinking when they received this letter, we've got some challenges here. But we're making progress. We're we're planting a church in the least likely place, maybe on the planet at that time. Look at what we've done. God must be pleased. Okay, so that's the backdrop to this letter that comes. And then you get to, to chapter 13, and there's this bombshell that goes off. The bombshell is, you believe you're doing well, that, that's their, their mindset. You believe God must be pleased with us based on the gifts at work and the results that you see. 
you have assumed that God is pleased with you. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I relate to that. I think I know what that feels like a little bit. Let, let's make that current for us. I'll go first. I can have a tendency to take a look at my own life and think, you know, I'm, I'm not bad at giving a sermon or two. I have people come up to me regularly and say how much they enjoy listening to me. And on a regular basis, people will say God uses something that I say to impact their lives in some Christ-like way. So I get it. When, when they paint the picture here of saying, God must be pleased with me then if I'm able to do all of these things that seem to be very useful, God must be pleased with me. I understand that. I think I feel that sometimes. How about as a, a whole community? If we as a church were to step back and, and say, do we get that? Do we, do we feel like them on any level? I think if we were honest, we would say, yeah. That, that we, our church continues to grow. We tend to attract a diverse uh, group of people, people from all over the spiritual spectrum and all, uh, all different places in their spiritual journey tend to, to walk through our doors. Yeah. I think we would say, God must be here and doing some things. God, God must be at work here. We, we give away a lot of money. We, we invest in places outside the walls of our church. God must be really pleased with us based on all of that. So I think I know how this feels. And then Paul says, you missed it. If, if that's what you believe, and I think I know what that feels like. I'm not going to speak for you. Paul says, I think you missed the point. All of that amounts to, did you hear it? Nothing. He says, all of that stuff means nothing if you don't love people. Bombshell. I'll, I'll put it another way. Uh, Tim Keller said this some time ago, and it's always stuck in my head. He said, it doesn't take a supernatural work of grace in the heart to preach well or to give away a lot of money or serve the poor. I'll say it again. It doesn't take a supernatural work of grace in the heart to preach well or give away a lot of money or serve the poor. It does take a supernatural work of grace in the heart to love people the way Jesus did. What's he saying? Just the same thing that the Apostle Paul is saying here. If you are counting on the things that you do or the things that we accomplish to, to prove that God is at work or pleased, you missed it. You, you, you were not looking at the, at the right place. There, there are different places where God says, this is what I expect of you. You're looking at the wrong one. Let's look at what the Apostle Paul says specifically. In, in verse 1, he says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, that's a, you have a supernatural prayer language given by God himself. It's pretty good. If you have the gift of prophecy, verse 2, and can fathom all wisdom and all knowledge, this See, prophecy doesn't mean just predicting the future here. Prophecy means speaking for God. You, can, you have a word uh, from God. You're so in tune with what God wants that you can tell people you, you can fathom all mysteries and knowledge. People come to you for wisdom. And you know the scriptures so well that you can just, boom, give them truth from God's word. Verse 2 continues. If you have faith that can move mountains, that, that you, are, you have faith, and, and they were healing people, actually, in God's name. In verse 3, if I give all that I have to the poor, if I give my body over to the flames, I'm willing to die for the cause. This is the way Paul paints the picture. If you have all of that, you can be doing all of that 
And if you don't love people, he says, it amounts to what? Yeah, nothing. Nothing. It says you're a clanging gong or a resounding cymbal. Now, that he picked those words very carefully because that apparently was what was going on in the pagan worship, in the temple up on the hill. That's what they would do. Clang gongs and rattle cymbals. What's Paul saying? You can do all of that stuff for God, and if you're not loving people, there's a very good chance that God looks at your worship and says, you might as well just go worship the pagan. You're not worshiping me. You think, how can that be? Well, let the magnitude of that sink in for a moment. It's it's painting this picture like there are two dials, um, um, like, you know, gauges in your car. And you are looking at this one that has to do with the amount of effort, success, uh, the, the amount of commitment, uh, the amount of serving that you do for God. And that one's looking pretty good. It's not as good as everybody's, but it's, it's the needle's way up here. And the Apostle Paul says, you're looking at the wrong gauge. Because the one over here is the love gauge, and it's on empty. And so you gain nothing. All of this stuff is meaningless if this one's on E. And I got to think, the people were thinking, what? what? How, how, how could this be? They must have been just in shock. And when I was reading this this past week, uh, I told some folks, in my mind, I pictured the old Willy Wonka movie, not the new one, uh, the old one with Gene Wilder. Uh, nothing wrong with Johnny Depp, but I really like the old one. And at the end of the old one, you remember this scene where Willy Wonka says, you get nothing. I think that's what they must have felt like here. I can tell you don't remember it, so I'm going to show it to you. Here, take a look at Willy Wonka. Mr. Wonka, I am extraordinarily busy, sir. Uh, I just wanted to ask about the chocolate. Uh, the lifetime supply of chocolate for Charlie. Well, when does he get it? He doesn't. Why not? Because he broke the rules. What rules? We didn't see any rules, did we, Charlie? Wrong, sir. Wrong. Under Section 37B of the contract signed by him, it states quite clearly that all offers shall become null and void if, and you can read it for yourself in this photostatic copy, I, the undersigned, shall forfeit all rights, privileges, and licenses herein and herein contained, etc., etc., fax mentis incendium gloria calpum, etc., etc., memo bis punitor delicatum. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. You stole fizzy lifting drinks. You bumped into the ceiling, which now has to be washed and sterilized, so you get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir. You get nothing. And I think that must have resounded as they read this letter. What's the teaching? If, if you want to look for evidence that there is a supernatural transformation going on in your heart, that's just a fancy way of saying if you want to know you're a Christian. If you are looking for evidence that there's this transformation going on in you, do not look, Paul says, to your service and activities. Look for love in your life. Look, look at the way that you love people. See, we tend to do just the opposite. We tend to look at activities and service and success and make excuses for the lack of love. Oh, well, I know that person is not very loving, but look at how smart they are. Look at how wise they are. Look at how much they know. Here's the way this comes to me uh, on a somewhat regular basis. There's some church or some gathering of Christians who feel like it's their God-given responsibility to point out where everyone else is wrong. And people come here who are a part of those groups, and, and they want us to participate in that. And I always have the same answer. I don't think that's, I think that's nothing. I think that the point is to love 
people. I'll tell you another way it comes to me. Uh, it, it comes to me when people want to debate theology with me. And I have to watch this because the way I'm wired, I could just go neck deep in the intellectual debating. I love it. Uh, but I don't think it's what I'm called to do. And so when someone wants to um, engage me uh, about um, pre-trib or post-trib or Arminian, Calvin, that I have a propensity to want to get all ramped up. And then I just sort of listen, and I say, well, does it matter in terms of who I'm supposed to love tomorrow? Will this change the way that I'm supposed to love the people who I come in contact with tomorrow? And usually the answer is no. So that stuff is not that it's unimportant. It's just way less important than my love gauge being on E. You can't get around that one. It's not an option. It's, it, it, sometimes you think, well, are you saying that I'll just be a little less um, uh, effective if, unless I was more loving? Like, it's like the love is like the cherry on top. You can take it or leave it. No, I'm not saying that. I'm, no, I'm not even saying that. I'm just pointing to the Scripture that says if you don't love people, it counts for nothing. All right, let's wrap it up. Two, two takeaways. Uh, the, the, the first takeaway, though, is only for one particular group of people, and it's the people who serve around here. We have hundreds of them. Uh, this first takeaway is for elders and deacons, for staff, for small group leaders, for people who tithe regularly. You're in the game here. I want to talk to you in this first takeaway. And that's sometimes that's different, right? You've heard a few sermons that weren't for you specifically, but you loved it because there were people here who needed to hear it. This one is for you, sorry. And the first takeaway, I think, is this. Don't confuse your giftedness or your service of God with the unmerited favor from God, with grace. B because grace... It doesn't boot off of the same thing as your gifts do, as your service does. There's a difference between gifts and fruit. Some of you are very, very gifted. But love is a fruit. And, and those two things are very different. Your usefulness, your ministry effectiveness or results are not a sign of the renovation of your heart. Your love is. Your love, that's the gauge that you have to look at. In fact, the Scripture gives us this bunch of dials to, to look at how's our love meter doing. And so you ask questions like, are you patient with people or do you have a short fuse? Do you, how often do harsh words just come naturally, naturally out of you? Are you super sensitive? Get your feelings hurt easily? Or do you... People don't want to come to you and confront you because of the way that you respond. Is it hard for you to let go of the way people have hurt you in the past? Have wronged you? Do you, do you constantly remember those things and bring them up? You say, yeah, well, maybe one of those. But I'm in ministry, man. I, I'm, I'm giving my life away. Don't get confused. That's nothing. If you don't love people, you're looking at the wrong dial. All right, last one. Take away for everyone. And everyone in the room probably falls on one side of this um, aisle or the other. There's some of you who are very, very gifted. And you uh, can, you're great speakers or you're great leaders or you're super compassionate or you have a hospitality. People feel welcome around you. Or you're not. <laughs> and you're always thinking, why didn't I, I, I can try as hard as I want. I'll never be able to do, and you point to one of the people on the other side of the aisle. Here, here's what I'm going to tell you. That if you have a lot of gifts, there's always someone better. That, that as good a speaker as you can be, a good leader as you can be, there's always going to be someone better. And, and that's okay. Why? Because even if you got no gifts, even if you're never going to be as good a 
teacher, speaker, or whatever it is, the thing that really matters, love, isn't a gift. It's a fruit. And apparently there's a big difference. The fruit is unlimited in its expansion possibilities. You don't ever have to stop becoming more loving. You will stop at some point becoming a better speaker. You will never need to stop when it comes to being a better lover of people, lover of God. Apparently, for both sets of people, the way that you can develop love in you is unlimited if you're connected with Christ. Golly, that's good news. It it means that you don't need one single extra thing from me or from anybody else in the room today to develop the way that you love people. You don't. You can just start loving them. And, And apparently, that never needs to stop expanding. You, anybody in the room, therefore, could become the most loving person in our whole community. It's fair game for everyone in the room. I think that's what changes the world. That's the thing. And Christ knew it when he left the planet. That's why he said, all people will know you're my disciples if you love one another. All right, we're going to stop here. But we're just getting started on love. Hope that whets your appetite. Hope you'll come back next week as we continue to talk about Love Illustrated. I'm going to turn it over to Jim in the Hampstead campus. We're going to prepare for communion.